Okay, so it's test time. So it's chapters seven and eight is what this review is most uh, uh, geared towards, which is dealing with ethnicity, race, and political geography. And oftentimes, those two subject areas tend to overlap in the study of AP Human Geography. And so we're going to take some time right now to figure out exactly what it is you need to know for my test. And this may or may not help you if you're not taking my test, but it is pertaining to many of the things we discussed in AP Human Geography dealing with race, ethnicity, and political geography. So the first thing that I want to discuss with you is dealing with ethnicity. And I want to reference a couple of maps that was in the book dealing with where the largest minority groups in the United States is situated or clustered. And so the first thing I'm going to look at is we're going to take a look at this map right here that shows uh, the Hispanic American population in terms of percentage. And notice that the map shows the percentage of the population that are predominantly Hispanic actually live near the Mexican border since the largest number of immigrants to the United States that are of Hispanic origin come from Mexico. It makes sense due to factors such as like distance decay, for example, um, that you would have many Hispanics living near the border and not super far away from it. All right, and so uh, when you guys see that map, it, it, it points out the idea that many Hispanics live very, very close to the border between uh, Mexico and the United States. Whereas this map right here will demonstrate that the African American uh, my, uh, minority group lives predominantly in the southern United States area where they have historically lived during the majority of the time that the United States has existed. Although I also wanted to make sure that everyone knows that at some point during the early 1900s leading up to the 1920s for example and during the 1920s you see waves of african-american migration from the rural south where they were sharecroppers into cities up north and if you ever read the book black boy by um uh, uh, uh wright his name is wright um then i hope i said that correctly then you will see a little bit of his uh attempts to go up north and, and uh, try to achieve or find a level of prosperity that, that didn't exist for uh, Southern Blacks during the Jim Crow era. The third largest minority group that we also discussed in class has to do with the Asian Americans living predominantly in the Western Coast region of the United States. Uh, again, due to the fact that it's a closer trip across the Atlantic, I mean, sorry, across, across the Pacific than it is from uh, you know, across half the world in the Atlantic Ocean. So therefore, you would see larger clusters of Asian Americans living in those regions. However, it's also important to say that the demographic breakdown is about about 60 to 70 uh, percent. I want to say the number is about today around the mid 60s percent white, um, and then about uh, I want to say about 14 percent Hispanic about anywhere between 12, uh, about 11 to 12 percent African American, and then everybody else is kind of, well, I guess your Asian American is going to be somewhere around uh, 2 or 3 percent, and then everybody else uh, uh, fits into whatever's left up. So um, in the future, one of the important points that we made earlier in class is that by 2045, those numbers are going to be such that Hispanic populations are going to grow, and and the white majority group is going to actually be the largest minority group in the United States. Minority being anything that's not 50% or more, all right? So uh, since, since uh, whites will make up 49% of the population, uh, we, white dudes like me, will also be a large minority in the United States of America. Okay, so know a little bit about those maps, know a little bit about African Americans migrating from the South, during that time, okay? And also understand the where Hispanics are gonna be clustered, what state and what regions Hispanics are gonna be clustered in. So th there's a few other things we need to discuss also when it comes to AP Human Geography, and these re re uh, re involve uh, terms and terminology. So what is race, what is ethnicity, and what is identity? Well, what I want you to know for AP Human Geography is that race tends to deal with physical characteristics or things that make someone visibly and physically distinguished from someone else, okay? Whereas ethnicity tends to be the cultural side of one's identity, all right? So how do they, what language they speak, what religion they believe in, what heritage they share. So ethnicity kind of sounds like nationality, which is yet another term that we discussed that has to do with someone's identity. So what is 
identity. Well, identity is more, more or less the things that someone is interested in, the things that someone does, the, the, the activities or the, the, the feelings one has that forms who they, who they are, who they say that they are, and how they act in terms of their lives and, and the people that they interact with. So there's a lot of things that you could go that could go into um, a measurement of one's identity. To add a little bit to our discussion of vocabulary terms, is we want to talk some about what a uh, what well what is nationality. If a nation has to do with a group of people that kind of long to have their own sovereignty within a country, um, and and they have common history, common ties to the land, and common ethnicity. Well, then perhaps nationality could be the, the characteristics of having all of those things. Oftentimes we see nationality and patriotism as somewhat the same, but they're really not exactly the same because, for example, American patriotism can be derived out of what it means to be American and is sharing American values. But nationality itself and nationalism comes out of the purity of who someone is and how that identity with these other people that are like us can foster itself in, in a way that promotes greatness within a state and can also break down a state as we all saw with Yugoslavia in the early 90s. So continuing on in our discussion, reviewing for the for the chapter 7 and 8 test, um, I also wanted you guys to know the differences between a stateless nation, a multinational state, uh, and a uh, multi-state nation. These are all different words that mean different things that are kind of common but really aren't the same at all. And that is, well, let's start with, uh, a, uh, with a stateless nation. Good examples of stateless nations would be the Palestinians, the Kurds, the Sikhs. These are all groups of people that have, may or may not have some degree of self-rule or autonomy. But they're ultimately looking for self-determination, which is more so a movement centered around uh, having a government that they can control their own fate and, and, and have their own sovereignty. Nobody can interfere with that. So um, self-determination is the, the, the longing for this degree of self-rule. Um, Multinational states are states like Russia, the United States, or Indonesia is a great example, where there are so many different national groups, sometimes if they don't get along, these can cause problems among one another as they struggle to get an edge on each other and establish a rule for themselves. A multi-state nation would be a, uh, a nation, again, like the Kurds, that might um, run over multiple state boundaries. And so the Kurds, you will see, if you look at the map, exist within Turkey, within Syria, within Iraq, and, and maybe a few in other places as well. And so that would be an example of a multi-state nation, a nation that crosses state borders. And once again, if we're talking about states, well, we live in the United States of America, but the definition I'm giving you guys for state more so has to do with a sovereign uh, 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 government. Or right, well, let's start from square one. You need a population. You need territory. You need to have sovereignty within that territory in order to be a state. And, and by that definition, the United States of America is a state, not just a country. A country and state are synonymous, right? So when we use state in AP Human Geography, we're almost always talking about a, another country. And so when we start looking at countries, there are actually different shapes that these countries or states can have. And so we discussed corrupt states, compact states, fragmented states, uh, perforated states, and elongated states. And so I want you guys to be able to take a look at the graphic that I'm showing you here and know an example of each of them, as you can see in the graph. So this is really, really important. We did an assignment in my class regarding the I also want you to be able to identify examples of nation states. And oftentimes, if you pick Europe, you can't go wrong, but sometimes you can, all right? For example, there are some European, even European micro states like Belgium that are actually very much multinational states. And if you remember, we discussed the concepts of the Walloons and the, and the, Fle the Flemings or the, uh, the, the, the Flemish, the people of Flanders, that um, you have one group, the Walloon speaking French, and the other group speaking uh, uh, like almost like a German dialect or a Dutch dialect, and uh, the two groups don't get along with one another, and even that tiny little state because of these issues even, even has a federal system of government. 
And so, uh, 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 you know, they, that wouldn't be a good example of a nation state. But for example, like Italy would be, France would be a nation state, Iceland would be a nation state, Japan would be a nation state, both Koreas would be nation states. And so a nation state is a state where the sovereignty exists within the nation itself. So French people speaking the French language, living in a French government within French territory is a nation state, right? And we discussed this at length in one of my earlier videos. Um, I also wanted to speak real quick again about the differences between unitary and federal system of government. A unitary system of government like France would be one that, can, that, that the central government itself controls the majority of the day-to-day -day stuff. They make the laws and on the local level, those laws are followed. Federal system of government actually are those that are um, that are local rule is given, like the United States, the states and their local governments uh, help the federal government to rule the country. Oftentimes, you will see where these un these uh, federal states are tend to be larger states, like the United States, like Brazil, like Russia, for example. But not always. Sometimes you will see where um, where uh, a federal state can be a lot smaller, uh, uh, and, and and oftentimes. The, the reverse of this is that you might see where many times unitary states tend to be smaller, federal larger, unitary smaller, but again, this is not always the case as we just now saw where Belgium is actually a uh, federal state. Something else that I was hoping to discuss with you guys in class prior to this test has to do with supranationalism, right? Supranationalism being like when several different groups come together to form a supranational organization like the European Union or the EU, the, Euro uh, the, the European Union or the EU, or the United Nations, the UN. And both of these groups are examples of supranational organizations designed to, for the UN, maybe promote world peace, maybe look out for things like genocide and try to help figure out diplomatic ways of dealing with world problems. It's substantially more uh, in-depth than that. Uh, you've got a few super important players within the United Nations, in particular the five permanent members of the UN Security Council, which is which is Russia, um, your United States, the uh, Great Britain, or, or the United Kingdom, that is, uh, France and Germany, the major players of the world um, political, or several of the major players of the world political um, uh, situation and economic situation after World War II. Um, and so those members are always going to be members of the UN Security Council. And the important thing here is that when it comes to state sovereignty or sta uh, statehood in particular, um, those five members have veto power and can basically stop and block any move to make a new country. And so uh, you may see where, for example, with Kosovo, it will never be uh, uh, you know, recognized by the United Nations because Russia won't let it. Um, and there are maybe other examples of states that, uh, once again, kind of fall into that same category where, where, where some states won't recognize formally the existence of others due to those five uh, permanent members. Um, the European Union represents a, 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 tr a trade arrangement with Europe to make them more, uh, I guess, competitive on the world market. And um, you've also got NAFTA, which is a, um, a, 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 a multinational trade zone in which most tariffs have been eliminated between Mexico, the United States, and, uh, uh, and Canada. I'm going to ask you about superimposed boundaries. And the best example of these superimposed boundaries are going to be those that you might see in like Africa after these uh, uh, European nation states went in and tried to decide who gets what and gave no regard whatsoever to the ethnic groups that already lived in those areas. And so uh, uh, this this is, is kind of like when you consider um, Africa's political boundaries today, they were actually drawn out by imperial colonial powers in the 19th century. Um, uh, and, and those countries were nation states thinking that, well, ev you know, everyone else can kind of fit this nation state mode. And even today, we tend to divide up the world in a very European-esque type way. Uh, uh, derived from from this uh, from these superimposed boundaries that they put in on the colonies. And I want you I want you to know what balkanization is. 
I want you to know what uh, apartheid is. Well, one at a time. Balkanization being the breakdown of, 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 of a country due to the differences of ethnic nations within that country. Yugoslavia is the best example of balkanization. And actually the word itself comes out of that region which is known as the Balkan Peninsula or the Balkans. Apartheid was like the Jim Crow, Jim Crow of South Africa. It was a policy, a legal policy, uh, that that was that was centered on segregation, the oppression of the the black majority in South Africa that existed um, during roughly the same time and even longer than Jim Crow in the American South, which did something very similar to the black minority groups predominantly in the southern states. Um, Jim Crow in the United States was actually somewhat of a, of a social thing as well uh, in that the federal law of the land after the Brown versus the board um, um, ended segregation in the United States legally but it still persisted at the state level and because it was deeply ingrained in many of uh, the southern whites of, of the I want you all to know um, um, relict boundaries as boundaries that were once something that now really are more of like a tourist attraction in a way. It's like the Berlin Wall, like Hadrian's Wall, like the Great Wall of China. These are all walls that once were boundaries or borders between states to keep people out. And today they don't really mean a whole lot. I also want you to know more about, uh, I want you to know about, um, about uh, 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 I just said superimposed. I also want you to know subsequent boundaries um, and antecedent boundaries. Right? Um, uh, uh, antecedent boundaries being like the, uh, the, the the Canadian and the United States boundary, one that uh, is, has already kind of been there for a long time. And as people kind of settled the territory, uh, the border just kind of continued to stretch along with it. Also know that the um, uh, Canadian border and the United States border is to date the longest uh, friendly border, I guess, undefended border in the world. Right? And uh, you, you know, it just it just goes to show a little bit about the feelings of friendliness that the United States and Canada have with one another. Many other states would probably kill for that degree of friendliness. We've been spending a lot of time looking at sovereignty and uh, and looking at forms of government and looking at conservative versus liberal ideology. Um, I want you guys to be able to place several of these different ideologies with their respective governments. So I want you to know what a monarchy is. I want you to know what a theocracy is and what a dictatorship is and know that all three of those forms of government are extremely conservative forms of government. Examples. Um, uh, well, you've got, you've got Saudi Arabia, which is, which is a monarchy. Uh, uh, you've got uh, Iran, which is a theocracy. You've got, um, uh, you know, we, we've talked a little bit about um, the United Kingdom being, uh, uh, you know, uh, a, a government that has a uh, monarchy, but it's more like a figurehead type thing. So uh, many of your old um, British Empire uh, 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 countries that came out of the British Empire are more so going to be like government systems based on the British government system with a prime minister and a parliament and all these different things that go into that. I also wanted you to understand a little bit about Democrats and Republicans and how most of the differences at a uh, in the United States level uh, between Democrats and Republicans have to do with such social and economic issues like who we go, uh, how much funding for the military. Um, uh, whether or not we are for or against uh, homosexual marriage or abortion or um, smoking marijuana legally. These are all issues that may come up as a as somewhat of a um, difference between Democrats and Republicans based in political stance. But ultimately, all Americans love the idea of and, and, and promote the idea of representative democracy, no matter which side of the aisle they may be on. I also want you guys, looking back at supranationalism just for a second, to be able to recognize the difference between the EU states and the ones who are in part of what we call the Eurozone, which are those individuals that use the similar currency called the Euro within Europe. They're not exactly the same, so I may show you guys a uh, map and ask you to identify a few of the countries that are part of the European Union but not part of the Eurozone.
I also want you guys to be able to identify and understand the concept of microstates, very, very tall, uh, I'm sorry, small countries in the world. And examples of them include Monaco, Andorra, the Vatican City, which is its own autonomous state, and also um, uh, Luxembourg could be considered to be a microstate. And there are others as well. So I want you to be able to identify some of these microstates. If you Google, you know, world microstates, you should be able to find maps and stuff to show you the majority of the ones on Earth. And that would be something that I would highly recommend that you guys do in preparation for this test. I want you all to be able to um, understand and, and you know, know the definition of a colony or, or a uh, territory that is legally tied to the sovereign state, to another sovereign state. When you start looking at imperialism, imper uh, imperialism means that a country is dominating people of other national groups uh, and, and essentially establishing colonies over those people. So I want you to understand what a colony is. I also want you to be able to, uh, we've already discussed nation states, to be able to identify nation states and and uh, and know what sovereignty is. I don't know if we've spoken about that yet, so I'm going to take a few seconds to tell you what sovereignty is, is uh, a state's ability to govern and control anything that happens within its own boundaries. And so we looked at how Russia, for example, goes in and annexes Ukraine and how in the late 90s, uh, you know, the NATO occupied Kosovo and later on Kosovo ends up having a referendum to become its own country. And both of these might be an example of how people on the, you know, other countries may have a differing de definition of what sovereignty is today because if a country like Russia can come in just because it's stronger and determine Ukraine's sovereignty, then what exactly do we mean when we say sovereignty? It's definitely something that's worth looking at in AP Human Geography. I want you to be able to identify uh, terrorism and know what the word actually means, but also know that the first time that we discussed or saw where terrorism was actually called terrorism in U.S. history, and this is coming right out of the Rubenstein book, in the U.S. history, in world history, is during the French Revolution, during the reign of terror where Robespierre goes in and basically tries to use fear tactics and terrorism to force people um, through state-sponsored government uh, terrorism more no less uh, to be in line with the values of the revolution okay and so that brings up the distinction between state-sponsored and non-state-sponsored terrorism state-sponsored being just what it sounds like where the government itself is the one enacting the terrorism and, uh, uh, you know, terrorism in and of itself is not state sponsored is when terrorist groups may thrive within a state, but are not actually sponsored by the state. Wrapping it up in our efforts to study for the ethnicity and political geography test, I also wanted you guys to be familiar with what the UK actually is in terms of Great Britain, Northern Ireland. Um, um, your, 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 your nations of the UK. I want you guys to be able to understand the geography and the nations there. And so we're actually going to watch a video clip on YouTube. Does a pretty good job at summing this up pretty quickly. But we're going to, I want you guys to be familiar with England, Scotland, Northern Ireland, and Wales as the nations that make up collectively the United Kingdom. And remember, when we discussed it was kind of a big deal earlier in the year with Scotland and that referendum where they actually voted to stay part of the UK even though many people thought that they weren't going to. Some people were freaking out about it and thinking, well, if, the, if the Scotland breaks off, then we're going to have all these different national movements across Europe and the world where different groups are trying to do something very similar. We discussed in class maybe how uh, perhaps Quebec might try to uh, to have another referendum for independence later on. How Greenland's probably going to become its own sovereign state at some point during your lifetime or whatnot. And so we discussed a little bit about maybe a few of these different uh, groups that may or may not have uh, movements where they try for self-governance or self-determination. I also wanted you guys to be able to tell me a little bit about if I gave you a line. And, and I put, you know, uh, left and, and right for liberal and conservative. And I asked you guys to list out different forms of government on that line. Like, where would direct democracy be? Or where would fascism be? Or So be familiar with, the, with, with that and, and be able to tell me a little bit about these liberal and conservative forms of government. So there you have it. 
I hope you guys feel studied up and I hope that this video is helpful in having you prepare for the uh, human driver test on chapter seven and chapter eight. Um, I hope that you guys benefit from this. Remember, it's not enough to know the answers. Everybody knows the answers. Only a few people are gonna make A's and high B's in the test because they're gonna study it for several hours in preparation for that day. Thank you very much. Till next time.